how did he deal with um, some of the worst political problems any incoming president has ever had to deal with? Uh, he's elected with a very, very weak plurality. It's not a mandate. He has less than 40% of the vote. He has the second lowest vote of a winning presidential candidate in our history, which is amazing if you think of how famous Lincoln has become to look at the, the bad hand he was dealt when he, when he won the election. He's, uh, after John Quincy Adams, he's the second weakest victor of a presidential race. Seven states secede after he's elected. So he's only the president-elect of half a country. And then as I develop in, in the book, it was not at all certain he could even make it to Washington to become the president of a country called the United States. And believe me, I had spent many years studying this period and I, I was shocked at how much new information I was able to find by really digging into journal accounts from the winter of 1860-61, um, private correspondence between important players like William Henry Seward, New York Senator and, and future Secretary of State and, and Lincoln. Basically, our democracy was hanging by a thread and the idea of a country called the United States of America was also hanging by a thread because Washington was not a very sympathetic capital to the presidential hopes of Abraham Lincoln and this very new and unformed party called the Republican Party, which was not a grand old party. It was not grand and it was not old and it was barely one party. It varied a lot. If you're a New England Republican, you're very different from a Illinois Republican or a Wisconsin Republican. They all have different goals and they're barely they're barely cohering as a party and Lincoln isn't much of a party leader. He's a kind of accidental nominee of party bosses. That, that's good for him, but he's not really dictating party policy. And then the situation in Washington is, is terrible. Uh, the Republicans are unpopular. There's another president, a Democrat, James Buchanan, who is sullen and uncooperative with Lincoln and is coming very close to recognizing the new Confederate government, which doesn't even really have a name yet, but the states have seceded away from the US. They just haven't quite formed their, their new government. Um, but foreign powers are on the verge, the phrase I use a lot, on the verge of recognizing this new slave-based country without a clear name yet. And what I was shocked to discover was how close the South came to sending a pretty small set of militia soldiers, it wouldn't have been organized troops, but a couple hundred men with guns from Virginia and Maryland into the city of Washington, DC, which was barely defended at all, and just taking over the US government, taking over the US Capitol, which included the Library of Congress and the Senate and the Supreme Court and the, and the House. And they would have had all of the treaties of American history. They would have had the patents that dictated so much uh, commerce. And they would have been able, uh, and they, there are paper records indicating this, they would have been able to call themselves the United States of America. And then Lincoln would have been a kind of rogue president-elect of something else who probably would have only been able to make it to Philadelphia. And he's the one who would have had to rename his country. I mean, no one quite knows what would have happened. But uh, through incredible moral leadership, which gathered huge numbers of Americans behind him, including people who had not even voted for him, and physical courage. And I talk a lot about how brave he was just to stand out on that train platform um, day after day and night after night where anyone could get very close to him. And that was the whole point because he's defending democracy and it's our need. And then one really wild ride the last night of the trip when he went all night in an ordinary passenger car of an ordinary commuter train that went from Philadelphia through Wilmington and Baltimore where there was a very serious uh, assassination conspiracy to take his life and arrived 
at dawn in Washington on February 23rd, 1861, and walked up the hill, Capitol Hill, and by arriving safely, I argue that he made everything possible, not just the four years of his presidency, which we now know very well as historians. The Civil War is one of the most important episodes in American history, but in my epilogue, I argue that so many episodes of America's moral leadership in the world and America's greatness as a country, including our late but important entry into World War I, and then our transformative role on us as well as on the world in World War II, when we, with our allies, crushed fascism, not just a few countries, but an ideology that was very powerful and reasserted the importance of democracy, race-blind democracy, by the way, and democracy with an economic component, as FDR always articulated it, as the primary organizing idea of the world from 1945 on. FDR dies in 1945, but we know very well what he says. And I argue that if Lincoln doesn't survive his train trip and then win the Civil War, and in the process revitalize all of those ideas about democracy and specifically the soaring language of the Declaration of Independence, which is a, a document about human rights in addition to declaring the right to form a new country. It's also asserting the rights of all human beings to foundational human rights. If Lincoln doesn't get off that train alive, I'm not sure how World War II turns out for the United States or the world. If we're fighting that war with an equally powerful Southern version of ourselves that still has either real slavery or some modernized version of wage slavery, we're not able to inspire the world's peoples to fight in World War II the way we successfully did. And I'm very aware that we've often fallen short of our own standards, and we have since then in Vietnam and Iraq. And I'm very aware that other countries often hold that up against us. But still, the fact that we won a civil war to reassert a better version of ourselves, and Lincoln's language is still important in, in, in learning how we did that, and that we stood up to fight fascism and then build the international architecture that this community of listeners knows so well, the UN, but so many of its dependent agencies, including in a time of pandemic, the World Health Organization. All of that is because people can work together and they should work together. We solve problems more effectively when we are united internationally as well as nationally and when we stop attacking each other for all of the well-known problems that, that we have. Mm -hmm.